Hello and welcome to Channels Book Club. I'm Olakunle Kasumo. We hope you are staying safe and doing the needful to protect yourself, family and community from COVID-19. It's a tough time for the world and people all over are very worried about the current coronavirus pandemic. The world has seen some terrible diseases, including the great influenza epidemic of 1918, which infected nearly 500 million people and killed 50 to 100 million people around the world. That's about 3 to 5% of the world's population at that time. But the world has come a long way since then. We are hopefully much more medically and scientifically equipped to handle pandemics. As serious as the situation is, please don't give room to fear. Be informed, be smart, stay safe, but give no room to fear. While most of us are self-isolating, remember it's a good time to pick up a great book to read. Um, a, such a book can provide insight, comfort, or escape. Now may be the time to finally dig into that book or novel you've had on your shelf forever. You may also want to try out something new. Here are two recommended non-fiction books and two recommended fiction books you want to pick up at this time. Disease and History by Frederick Cartwright. Disease and History examines plagues which brought down ancient Greece and Rome, the Black Death which devastated 13th century Europe, and more recently, AIDS and the SARS epidemic. Disease, the story of disease and mankind's continuing struggle against it by Mary Dobson. The compelling and sometimes frightening stories of 30 deadly diseases and of humanity's efforts to combat them. If you want to explore novels instead, there are many to pick from. Here are two acclaimed ones. Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel. Much of Mandel's acclaimed novel is set in the wake of a devastating strain of the flu, which kills 99% of humanity. The book's structure juxtaposes scenes of survivors of the epidemic with the sudden end of the world as we know it, as the Georgian flu wrecks havoc. Mandel's story is an ultimately hopeful one, focusing on the ways art endures. The Old Drift by Namwali Sapel. The Old Drift covers over a century of history in Zambia, beginning in the colonial era and ending in the near future. But it's when the narrative turns to the effect of AIDS on the country that the book takes an emotionally wrenching turn. But hey, you may want to stay away from books that will scare you. You can pick up anything completely unrelated to get your mind off the existing problem. Comedy, sports, well-being, money, business, and so on. We remain hopeful and optimistic that we will beat this coronavirus. So, in that spirit, let's deviate from health now to something unrelated yet important. We've heard about five-star hotels, five-star airlines, five-star services, and so on. But how about a seven-star professional? Well, our guest today has written a book about what it means to be a seven-star professional and how to become one. First, let's get to meet him, get introduced to his book, and enjoy a reading from it. After then, we'll show you a chat with him to explore his book, The Seven Dimensions of a Seven-Star Professional. Please stay with us. Okay, my name is DG Jemio. Um, the title of this book is The Seven Dimensions of a Seven-Star Professional. Achieve accelerated and sustained career success. So um, I'm a performance turnaround expert. I'm also the founder of German Consulting, a project management company, and also the founder of Diba, a collaborative work software company. So I'm going to read chapter seven of the book. This chapter talks about the political dimension. And let me start with this quote. The quote states, just because you do not take an interest in politics, doesn't mean politics won't take an interest in you. So, um, after leaving school, many high flyers are thrilled by the prospect of working for a big company, probably a multinational. 
They are fascinated by the enormous opportunities available and are over the moon when they picked up the appointment letter. With vivid imagination of a bright future. However, after a few years, this initial enthusiasm dwindles with some getting completely sidetracked. After repeatedly watching colleagues with lower qualifications and seemingly less knowledge getting ahead, they become disenchanted and gradually suffer a decline in their productivity. I recently met with one who remarked, I can't stand all the office politics in this organization. It is not what you know, but rather it is who you know. If you don't belong to the right cabal, you won't be promoted or deployed on big projects. Nepotism, preferism, backstabbing, self-interest is the order of the day. I thought working for a global company means less politics and more merit. I said to him, the street belief in merit is a myth. History is filled with organizational matters, like him mourning over the unfairness of life. This outward gifted and hardworking individuals, despite having the best of intention, eventually lose out because of their inability to navigate office politics. On the other hand, we have the players who by their very nature are the exact opposite of these purists. While players respect official rules and regulation, they understand that the unofficial rules of politics are often equally as important. If you think you can succeed at work without getting political, DG, you need to wake up and smell the coffee. The stark reality before any professional is that politicking happens whether we like it or not. It is evident everywhere, from our homes to our schools, our workplaces and even our religious houses. In fact, wherever two or more people are gathered to work together, you find politics at play. The reality Due to the negative connotation associated with politics, many people see office politics as a negative aspect of human relations. A low down dirty means of getting ahead and sometimes very much to be avoided. Saying that someone is political generally stirs up images of backroom dealings, manipulation or hidden agendas for personal gain. But the truth is, to ensure success, and that of your initiatives, you must navigate the mild feed of office politics. The popular misconception of office politics are clarified as follows. Politics is a nasty business. Instead of thinking of playing office politics as a game of chess or strategy, through which you can get the resources and influence you need to accomplish your goal, only people at the top are involved in politics don't wait till you are CEO. Politically aware professionals take some control at any level, have a clear agenda and act on it. The ability required to join the inner circle to manage conflict and to protect oneself from negative politics is accessible only to a few. Wrong. Everybody can play the political game. Playing politics is a waste of valuable work time. Studies have shown that those who build their career quickest spend as much as one third of their time at work in political activity. They view this investment as critical in growing their network and relationships vital to their success. Developing a high level of political sagacity is actually a necessity for career success. All organizations are political and to a high degree the underlying reasons are largely physiological. Firstly, work involves dealing with people. That means finding a compromise between what they want and what you want. Wrongly, this is usually viewed as a zero-sum game. Secondly, humans as emotional creatures are normally biased by unconscious needs and riddled with insecurities. This, act, this actually led Aristotle to proclaim, 
man is by nature a political animal. The seven dimensions of a seven star professional achieve accelerated and sustained career success. First of all, content quality aside, I really like the production of your book. Thank you very much. It's really, it's really good. It's good. 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 I don't want to ask you where you printed this. Let's leave that for another. <laughs> it's not locally. <laughs> well, it's not locally. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's really nice. It's well done. So we can do a lot of good um, production locally. Yes. Mm. Uh, there are good production guys in Nigeria too. Okay. It's really nice. Well done. So the seven dimensions of a seven star professional. This is part of a, you call it results series. series. Tell me about, about this. So the goal of the results series is to help professionals get the best out of their life, professional life. Okay. So um, in this series, we talk about the principles people can deploy to achieve the best in their careers and businesses. So we found out that over the years, most people just walk around aimlessly without a clear cut roadmap in order to achieve and fulfill their potentials in life. So the results series will tell you about the principles and we distill it into easy to follow steps that can be deployed by anyone. By anyone. Hmm. Yeah. This is very deep. Uh, I have to say, reading through it, we'll, we'll dig into it a bit later. But you said for this particular book, seven dimensions of a seven star wow. professional. And then you started with this illustration of this seven star hotel. Yes. To, to illustrate what you mean by seven yes, star professional. Uh, seven star, correct. So um, over the past few years, I've been working a lot in Dubai. So there is this seven star hotel that everybody that comes to Dubai must see. So let's note in the hotel business, the highest rating for hotel is five star. Five star, yeah. But this hotel is clearly above five star rating. So, and I thought, how can every professional or you and I become above and beyond the regular professional? Because we found out that over the years, most people have been trying to understand the formula for success especially in their career because a large percentage of people still work as career people even if you're a business person you are building a career but the question is how can you have easy to follow principles that can be deployed by anyone um, growing up in nigeria we believe that um, maybe having first class or two one is a ticket we'll, to success we'll make you for life yes yeah, a ticket to success but we found out that is beyond that but the question is what leads to fulfilling and satisfying career. So most of all, if you even ask successful people, they can't really break it down. Mm. Most people will say it is God. In mm. this part of the world, <laughs> yeah. most people will say it is God. But so in the past seven years, I've been interviewing successful people, doing lots of research on what really leads to career success. So, and I now break it down into these seven dimensions. So this seven dimension is like, a, is a cocktail of solution. Because what happens most often is that people focus on maybe one or two dimensions without looking at the holistic okay. dimensions. Mm. We'll come back to that. But seven stars. So you're saying here that a professional can go beyond the more common Two star, three star, yeah, three star. Yeah, and then so, exceeds yeah. the more, more revered, more respected five star, yeah. and then rise up to seven star, yeah. really top notch, high quality yeah. level. Yes. In the mm. book, I mentioned um, people can easily relate with the messes of this world because we can see Messi, Ronaldo, um, Roger Fedra, Serena Williams, who's in boats, have seven star professionals in their world. So the question is, how can people in the business arena to become seven stars? The regular, the regular folks. In, and what I mean is people in regular professionals. In professionals. Yeah.